Welcome to the Virtuosity Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Ethan Wiley, along with my co-host here, Timo Shanko. Hello. Hello, Timo. Now, Timo, you're in, in Boston, or just north thereof. Yeah. And uh, and I'm here in the Smoky Mountains of uh, North Carolina. <laughs> well, no, the Smoky Mountains of Marin County. Oh, my God. Uh, where the smoke has finally uh, drifted into the Bay Area the last few days. So Sorry. if my voice sounds, uh, you know, strange. You sound fine. Sound <laughs> okay. fine. Uh, it was starting to affect me yesterday, but, uh, uh. you know, last year when this happened, uh, I lost my voice completely. That wouldn't have been good for doing podcasting. Well, I had all my gigs this weekend canceled due to a hurricane coming, <clears throat> if that makes you feel any better. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> So we're doing a show called Virtuosity, and... It's basically going to be exploring musical virtuosity in all genres and with all instruments. Um, not that we're ambitious or anything. <laughs> we're going to start with uh, a lot of cool things. Um, and to give people an idea of what that means, um, we're going to be exploring, for example, 1950s jazz piano in our, in our second episode. One of my favorites. Yes, and and uh, and then we're going to be going on to modern bluegrass guitar. One of your favorites. And then we've got all sorts of interesting things. We've got uh, Peter McClintock, director of the Metropolitan Opera, who's going to come in and talk to us about uh, opera singers and their uh, quest for virtuosity. We have a lot to learn there. Yes, that was important that we have a guest on that show. Um, <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> And uh, and then we've got, uh, on the Modern Bluegrass Guitar Show, we had uh, bassist and producer uh, Todd Phillips, who's going to be weighing in on uh, Modern Bluegrass Guitar, and we chose Todd because he's played with all these guys and had a really right. unique perspective as a bass player who's worked with all the top cats in bluegrass guitar, so uh, that's going to be a great episode as well. Um but first, I thought I'd give just a little bit of uh, background about uh, who you are and a little bit about myself. Um, Timo, tell us a little bit about uh, what you do. Oh, it's trying to like I'm trying to do a comprehensive study of the entire music. I know it sounds pretentious and undoable, but I thought I'd just go ahead and give it a try while while you're still alive. And uh, it's like trying to play all the instruments as well as anybody can, try to understand the music deeply as well as anybody can, including classical, especially modern classical, really analyzing the harmony and tearing everything apart note by note, you know, transcribing everything by everybody and getting as deep on it as you possibly can. It's sort of a lifelong mission. There's no no place to end up like, okay, I'm done. I did it. You know, it's, that's not like that. It's like a way of life where you, you do it 10 hours a day, every waking moment for the rest of your life and see where it takes you. Just try to humbly work on the music all the time. Cool. And, um, and so you, you grew up in Santa Monica. Yeah. Long time ago. And, uh, and then you went, you got to the Boston area, uh, attending the Berkeley school of music as many musicians do. Yeah, although they uh, that's a school that more gives you the tools for maybe how to work on music and to meet lots of other people from lots of different places to kind of illumine your mind to music that you wouldn't have heard. Uh, you know, being from Los Angeles, we can be a very commercial place, so its its orientation is towards the commercial aspect of music, and coming to the East Coast was eye-popping because people were doing it just to do it and playing circles around me. It was fantastic. It was, uh, you know, I had to get busy. I had to get started. I had to get working, get cracking. And uh, so I could thank the school for that. But it, And it gave you the tools for how to work on it. I mean, you know, it's a very short stint. You go there for a couple of years. You know, that a couple of years goes by in a flash, right? Right. And it's really how you apply yourself uh, after you're at the school that really makes the difference, I think. Because, you know, you're graduating college when you're 20 or 21 years old. That's, you're just still a kid. Yeah. 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 And uh, I went to school at UCLA studying theater and film. 
And uh, but that's a prestigious uh, locale. You were in the same class as as, as bigwigs before you, right? Yeah, yeah, we had a pretty successful class, and and uh, um, and and so that's been the focus of my career. But uh, on the side, I've been a amateur, semi-professional musician at times, uh, playing the mandolin. And uh, we're going to be hearing lots of mandolin <laughs> as we go forward. Well, yeah, and, that's your that's your that's your happy that's your favorite part of it, you know. Yeah, and and uh, I first heard uh, David Grisman in the. 1970s and was you know going into San Francisco uh, to see him playing with Stefan Capelli at the Great American Music Hall, and uh, and so I had been playing guitar, and uh, and so went out and got myself a hundred and thirty dollar mandolin at the McCabe's Music Shop there in Santa Monica, your hometown. Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, I saw Don Cherry there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, you've always. You've always been very humble about your, you know, whether you're a professional or, uh, you know, but you still are on the quest. You've always enjoyed virtuoso music, whether it's John McLaughlin or Frank Zappa or, you know what I mean? So your approach to it and, and your father is, has this proximity to Stephen Reich and Phil Lesh and, you know, so you're, you, you've kind of always been thinking that way. You're just modest about your identity as, you know, musician, which is a, a pompous identity thing to call yourself anyways you know can't you just be a human being that happens to play music like anybody else yeah and, and I, yeah and I grew up with a musical family you know just right. jamming uh, dad knew three chords and and uh, four by four uh, time meant nothing to him yeah um, right <laughs> there's only two time signatures anyways three and four right yeah well he was be somewhere <laughs> be in between you know usually yeah, well, but, yeah. um, but I had an rubato, yeah yeah I had an uncle that was a good bluegrass musician uh, and played with some excellent musicians uh, in the Bay Area. And, and you've studied and you've studied with very legit teachers of the genre. Yeah, a little bit here and there, mostly self-taught. But uh, yeah, so same thing. Just uh, I guess with another career, you know, I pursued music uh, in between the in between the lines and and um, and like you said, our friendship was kind of born out of a mutual. Uh, love for uh, Jaco Pastorius. Oh yeah, my man. And I happened to be uh, writing a screenplay based on Bill Mikowski's book uh, for some producers in Hollywood. It was kind of a dream come true for me to kind of fuse my my movie thing and my music thing with writing the screenplay. Unfortunately, the production never made it for a variety of reasons. Um, well, I'm sure I'm sure people that are. Uh, Arbiters of Jocko's estate are going to kibosh anything, right? It's just going to make it difficult. That's what they do. It was complex, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and the producers finally gave up. But um, but anyway, yeah, I, I went into a little pub there in uh, Brookline. Uh, what was the place called again? Matt Murphy's? Matt, Matt Murphy's. They were talking yeah, about 20 Matt years Mur ago. Yeah, it's about 20 years ago now. Right. And, the, and there was a, a great jam scene going on there. And... Uh, and I think I'd heard you on the radio, and and uh, you'd done like that's a, right, and that, yeah, and you came down because you had heard something on the radio, if I remember correctly. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, I, I thought I got to go check this guy out, and uh, and and so I after the gig, uh, I met your drummer first, Luther Gray, awesome drummer, and he asked, you know, me, are you into jazz or you know music or you a musician? I said, well, I'm doing this and that. And I said, hey, I'm writing a script about Jaco Pastorius, and he said, oh, you got to meet, meet Timo. And I said, the sax player. He said, oh, yeah, he's really a bass player. <laughs> and so I said, okay, i got to meet this guy, and that's how we met. Um, and, and so then we started having a lot of conversations over the years about music and just trading, um, you know, music and uh, ideas and talking about what you were up to and... and um, and so at a certain point, I thought, I should be recording these conversations because I'm learning so much about music from you. Yeah, and, and, you, and, and you really can't shut us up once we get started. We're trying to do a 10-minute episode right now. You know it's going to go on for 45 minutes. <laughs> you're going to have your hands full at the editing floor there. Yeah, well, I'll try to tighten this up. But <laughs> um, anyway, so, um, so that's how this uh, came to be. So um, a couple quick things to tell people. Um, we're on Spotify, and the reason we chose Spotify as a kind of launching pad for the for the show is that if you are a member of Spotify, you're going to get the full cuts of all the music we talk about, and not just the 30-second clips. 
which I've, you know, in a lot of other podcasts, they give you the little snippet and they keep the conversation going. But we're really digging into the music here. And I thought it was really important to give people that option to listen to the full cut right there as we're talking about it, analyzing both on the front end and the back end, and really hear the full music, even if it's eight minutes long, ten minutes long sometimes. Well, and that's not very long. I mean, it, we're not going to do like full, are we doing full Coltrane 30 minute solos? Are we doing like full Indian 30 minute solos or what? I don't, I don't think we'd be needing too much of those um, because right. people can always go pursue the music for the for the long, right, uh, right. intense. So it keeps that five to eight minute, you know, three to five to eight, right? Yeah, yeah. But not 30 seconds. And, um, and then if you're not a, um, a member of Spotify, then you still get the 30 second clips. And so, in addition to that, we're going to be on YouTube, where we're going to have the shows on YouTube, and you'll be able to um, see a lot of video um, of, of uh, the things we're talking about. So, if we find good video of the song or a performance, uh, we'll, we'll put those up in place of the, the record cut. And, uh, and then, another uh, important thing we're going to be doing is we're going to have a Patreon page and this is going to be a little bit more focused on the dedicated musicians and, and your expertise in, in, in that you have uh, created quite a lot of transcriptions of a lot of the music we're going to be talking about, especially, especially when we get into jazz. Yeah, thousands. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to be doing an eight-chapter uh, audio biography of John Coltrane, and then... That's where, like, the Patreon page will come place where you're going to have transcriptions, a lot of the solos and things that we're going to hear on those recordings, and other musicians as well. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're going to have uh, uh, lessons, online lessons, uh, in both music theory and also for, you know, people wanting to take next steps with their bass playing, their sax playing, and uh, there'll be composing. limited... Composing. Composing. And composing. You know? Yeah, yeah, like like harmonic analysis of all the classical music. Yeah, um, and so anyway, so there'd be a lot of great material there for people, and we're going to make the the bar of entry low financially, so a lot of people can get involved, and um, and so anyway, so we're going to be on on a few different platforms like that, and um, so let's get back to the word virtuosity. Mm -hmm. um, it's a controversial word at times because I think people have so many different interpretations of what that means. Um, how do you describe virtuosity? To you? Well, I think I think we should take advantage of describing it in a much broader sense than it ordinarily gets used in you know virtual virtu virtually anything. You can play virtually anything on the violin, virtuoso. That's what it means in a sense, right? But yeah. that would always that always connotes uh, you know. Uh, very fast arpeggios and scales and approach patterns and sort of furious, you know, going at it, art, you know, artatum virtuosity on the piano. But there's other kinds of virtuosity, right? Virtuosity of using space, virtuosity of playing the blues, virtuosity of the spoken poetry forms, virtuosity in this kind of music, in that kind of music. It could be virtuoso of... of just about anything when you think about it. So it's the broadest sense of the term, not the smallest sense of the term, right? Yeah, and I thought that, that um, you know, with the different connotations that, like, you know, punk rock or something will say, hey... <laughs> Anti-virtuosity music, for sure. <laughs> right? And But then, within that genre, you know, you start to parse, like, these are the good good ones, these are the ones that are not so good, you know? Right. Well, there's 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 virtuosity to Joe Strummer in the Clash, right? Because he's yeah. he's got that thing that's that that he's got the golden thing, whatever that is. That's that the the word thing that he does, the leader of a movement. Right. Yeah. Or Bob Dylan. You know, everyone's always saying what a terrible singer he is, and not well, you don't go to see musician. him for Pavar. You know, you go to Pavarotti for singing. You don't go to Bob Dylan for for golden tonsils. You go to him for amazing poetry and the leader of a movement.